Hello and welcome to this presentation, Point à la ligne, Dictation Across the Key Stages. This is a presentation that I originally delivered at Language World Conference 2024. So my name is Claire Seckham and I'm a primary languages teacher and an independent consultant. I currently teach Spanish in two primary schools and French in a third one. I've already blogged about dictation on my blog and you can see the URL just here. And there are some dictation resources already on Lightbulb Languages, which is my website. And the bottom URL there is for my online shop where I already have a Spanish dictation pack if you'd like to have a look at that. The two questions that I'll be endeavouring to answer during this presentation are firstly, why dictation? So why am I talking about it? Why should we be doing it? And then I'll be moving on to the how. How can you teach dictation and how can you get students to practice the requisite skills? First then, why am I talking about dictation? So on the 4th of June, 2023, it was widely reported by both the French and the UK media that a record-breaking dictation had taken place on the Champs-Élysées in Paris. Altogether, 1,650 people took part and three different texts were dictated. Interestingly, and this shows how unfamiliar we've become with dictation in this country, BBC News reported it as a mass spelling contest. It's true that dictations have fallen out of favour in language teaching since they were last part of O-level exams in the mid 80s. However, an internet search shows that they maybe are still used to a certain extent in TEFL. Now, I took O-level French in 1985. It was the AEB board and dictation was our listening paper. Actually, we were the last cohort to do it because the following year group did a listening comprehension from the old reel to reel tape. But we had to do both a listening comprehension and the dictation as some kind of very mean bridging exercise. When I was pre preparing this presentation, I looked back over my old French books from secondary school, which are absolutely full of dictations. We did them often. And these two here are from third year of secondary school, in other words, a year nine equivalent. And you can see the sort of length and the sort of complexity that we were expected to deal with at that time. Of course, the best thing about dictations in those days was that they were negatively marked. So if you miss off an accent, half a mark off. If you make a spelling mistake, one mark off. And it was pretty easy most of the time to rack up some fairly low marks. So not very motivating, I'm sure you'll agree. At around the same time as the mass dictation, the specifications for the new MFL GCSEs were appearing, with dictation being part of the listening component for these new exams. So these are the overviews for AQA and Edexcel. At the time of when I was writing this presentation, the EDUCAS specification hadn't been approved, so I haven't included it here. And you can see that dictation will comprise 20% of the marks for the listening and understanding component. Now, these courses will be taught for the first time in September 2024 and examined for the first time in 2026. This means that all of our students who are currently in year nine and lower will have to do dictation in GCSE, assuming that they take it. And so it makes sense to start preparing students for it in Key Stage 3 and even in Key Stage 2. So here is one reason why we should be including dictation in our teaching and learning repertoire right now. Now, these are the sample dictation questions for foundation tier from AQA and Edexcel. And as you can see, they are slightly different from each other. And students are expected to write what they hear at sentence level. So it's nothing like the extended text that we were expected to tackle at O level. <clears throat> so why else should we be doing dictation activities? Well, students have to listen to spoken language and then write it using their knowledge of phonics, spelling and grammar to help them to get it right. 
reading is also involved in some dictation activities and of course for you the teacher dictation activities are a source of formative assessment dictation can also be used to reinforce or to introduce certain structures or topics in some dictation activities students are encouraged to memorize language dictation can then lead on to both oral and written activities there's also scope for students correcting their own work and then there are opportunities here for overlearning the language and I'll talk more about overlearning later. Dictating and therefore modelling a sentence helps the students to put the new words and the new structures into a context. Dictation, of course, is a very calm and a very quiet activity. The teacher can select interesting texts to do that with. And of course, that means that all students are actively doing something. It's clear, by the way, that dictation in Spanish and German is considerably more straightforward than it is in French. French is a relatively opaque language with many silent letters and homophones, which make it a lot more difficult. So now that we've established why we should be considering dictation for our lessons, let's go on to think about the how. How should we do it? It's an activity that can be tackled on different levels, ranging from single letters or sounds all the way up to sentences and groups of sentences making texts. Just before I run through lots of different activities for you, um, I'll talk a bit about where I got them from. So first of all, I hunted around on the internet, um, as well as looking at these two publications. The first one on the left-hand side there was published in 1988. Um, it's a bit outdated because of that. However, it, it does still have some useful ideas. The second one on the right hand side is one of a series that is written for different age groups for French children to practice their dictation at home. So this particular one is for CP. So starting off then with single letters or phonemes. So for example, if you give the students a starter word, so for example, in French, that could be salon and then you dictate a second word which is either one letter or one phoneme different from the starter word so we could make that a vowel sound or we could make that a consonant sound so we could show the, the students salon but di um, dictate selon and they have to write the new word knowing that nearly all of it's going to be the same similarly we could change the consonant sound so the students would see salon but here, savon, and they have to change the letter accordingly. Similarly, this would work in Spanish if you show the students mano, but say mono, and they have to change the correct vowel sound. Again, we could change the consonant sound, show them mano, but dictate majo. This can also work with syllables. So, for example, in Spanish, we could give them the starter word bote and dictate the word bola which is one syllable different, and they have to write the new word. Also, for a single letter or a phoneme, we can fill in the missing letters or sounds. So what you have here are some place names with all of the vowels missing. So the first one is Chartres, and the second one is Limoges. Then for Spanish, we have Cáceres, and Sevilla. So for this, it's a case of knowing all of the basic vowel sounds. We could, of course, miss out consonants instead. For this one here, the students have to choose the correct sound or letter from a choice of two. And this works very well for minimal pairs. So a pair of sounds that are very similar and that students confuse regularly. I've just had a conversation with one of my year three learners about the difference between sh and j, one of them being voiced and one of them being unvoiced. So for this first one, the student would hear the word joli and they know that they have the two sounds sh and j to choose from. So they would have to write in the correct sound there. Similarly, on the second one, we've got the difference between the ny sound and the simple n 
sound. So they would hear here año and they would have to write in the correct sound there. This works very similarly in Spanish. For example, the two consonants b and p are pronounced in a very similar way. So if the student was to hear boca, they would have to put in the correct consonant there. Um, younger learners find the Spanish single R quite tricky and often confuse it with an L sound. So if they heard the word carrera, would they know which consonant they would have to put in there? We're always thinking about ways that we can support students as they start to learn these new skills. And of course, dictation is no different. So on this particular activity, the students have the support of knowing that they have all the necessary syllables, but they have to listen in order to work out the order that those syllables need to go in. So, for example, the first one would be dernier. And the second one is lendemain. Similarly, in Spanish, we have soldado and escándalo. For an extra challenge, you could give the syllables for a phrase or a sentence. And so students then have to know where the finger spaces go, as well as knowing which order the syllables go in. Now, syllable strings are very good for very focused listening. And again, another really great way of differentiating between minimal pairs. So one example of minimal pairs is uh, the nasal sounds in, in French. So the top line there, they would hear on, un, un, on, un, on, on, and have to write the correct sound each time. As a support, and again, to facilitate um, listening and writing, you could give them a little box to start with in which all of the sounds that they're going to hear feature, but they have to know which one to write at which time. Um, this works in a very similar way to Spanish. For example, we know we have several ways of making the th sound, two ways of making the b sound as well. <clears throat> so it's all good ways, again, of differentiating not only between consonant sounds, but between vowels as well. And this could also work with a string of words. So thinking in very simple terms about your Spanish, about your French um, indefinite articles, the difference between un and une, un, une, you can dictate those in a string and they have to write the right ones each time. Again, to support dictation and the writing of single words now, we can give students a box per letter to write in. So, for example, this top French word has got six boxes. The word has six letters and that word is vision. We could further support as well by putting the vowel boxes in a different border so that students know which are the consonants and which are the vowels. This will work as well in Spanish, where the top word there is primer, and we can see that that one has a different pattern of vowels. Also for single words, we could support students by giving them one space per letter that they need to write with a dash for each one. You may want to further support them by giving them a letter or a couple of letters. And this is good support, of course, for knowing especially with French, where those silent letters are. So the first word is école. And of course, they have the five dashes, so they need to know that it's going to have a silent E at the end. The second one there has one letter given. That one is uniforme, where a similar thing will apply. The top Spanish word here is leader. And the second is a favourite of all my year fives, volleyball. And this is a good example of where English words have been borrowed into Spanish, but then represented in writing using Spanish sounds. So it's a case of even though it sounds like English, it's likely that it's not going to be spelled the same as English. Another variation on this theme is the use of word shapes, which show the shape and size of each letter that is needed. So the tall boxes are for letters like B and L and K and T. The longer boxes that hang underneath the line are for the letters like G and Q and P. And the little squares are for all the other letters like the vowels, S, R, W, and so on. So the French word here is bloqué. So we can see the shape of the word there. And the Spanish word is amplio. 
Also for words, we can give students some letter cards because especially for younger and uh, less experienced learners, writing on an exercise book page um, is quite a daunting prospect. They think it's permanent. Um, it's, it's something that can't be easily edited. It's something that's going to be there forever. Using letter cards, though, they're much easier to edit. They're not permanent. And moving the cards around on the table as well it, um, appeals to quite a lot of children. It's also a really good pair activity. So as well as single letters, you could have syllable cards or phoneme cards. And of course, this activity can also be upgraded to using word cards for making phrases or sentences. Now, this is a classification activity where the students listen either to a list of words or maybe to a longer text, and they write the words that they hear in the correct place on the grid. Now, of course, this is assuming a level of understanding of the words as well as knowledge of the sound and spelling link. Um, this would also work well with opinions where you have four boxes, for example, j'adore, j'aime, je n'aime pas, je déteste and the students listen to a series of things and they write them in the correct box according to their own personal opinion. We can also use dictation for captioning pictures. So for phrases, find a picture or pictures that students are going to label with the words that they hear. It could be as simple as pictures to label or it could also be a picture story with sentences that they write next to the appropriate picture. Also with phrases, we can fill in the missing words. So students have here the support of having some of the words already in the phrase, and then they have to listen and fill in the missing word or words. So these ones are all to do with um, celebrations. The first French one is la fête du citron. And the second is la fête nationale. Then for Spanish, we have El Día de la Amistad and Las Fiestas de San Juan. Now, when a dictation activity is completed, there are going to be several ways that you might want to check the student's work. So firstly, you as the teacher could mark it. Secondly, the students could peer mark or the students could mark their own work. And of course, each of those has its pros and its cons. Now, with this activity, once students have completed the dictation, they're given a correct model that they can self-check against, and they write in the correct version into the checkbox, even if they were right the first time. Now, this checking and this rewriting is called overlearning. And the neuroscientist Victoria Sayo Turner refines this as the process of rehearsing a skill, even after you no longer improve, even though you seem to have already learned the skill, you continue to practice at that same level of difficulty. A recent study suggests that this extra practice could be a handy way to lock in your hard earned skills. And of course, this process is going to suit all levels of languages of language from word all the way through to texts. Moving on to sentences now. And in this activity, the students have a framework of questions. Then the teacher dictates the answers and the students have to write the answers in the right place with the right question. So again, there's a level of understanding involved as well as the sounds and the spelling. Of course, this could also be done the other way around, give them the answers and dictate the questions, because question forms are often quite a hard thing to practice. Another way to support students at sentence level is to give them all the words that they need for a sentence, but mixed up or scrambled. Um, as a preparatory step, they could have a go at unscrambling the words to predict perhaps what the sentence will be when they hear it. So for the French example, we have the sentence J'aime jouer au basket and in Spanish Me gusta jugar al rugby. Now, we can also do some error correcting at sentence level, and this works with a longer text as well as with sentences. So the students listen and follow the text in front of them, 
And as the first step, they underline any words that are different in their text to what they hear. Then when they hear it the next time, they write in the words that they actually hear. And if you're creating an activity like this, make sure that you leave plenty of space between the lines for the students to write in those new words. Now, in this activity, changing one word in the sentence, the students listen and write the sentence as per a normal dictation. And once they've checked it or marked it in one of the ways that we just mentioned, they have the challenge of changing one of the words in the sentence so that the sentence still makes sense. And perhaps they could then dictate that new sentence to a friend or to the rest of the class. So um, in these two sentences, I've changed the places. So in the French sentence there, we know it has to be a masculine place because we have au marché. So we could perhaps change it to hier je suis allé au collège. Similarly, in the Spanish sentence, we know that this has to be a masculine place name because it has al. So ayer fui al hospital. Another idea is a beep dictation. So in your transcript for a beep dictation, you'll have the text with certain words removed and the word beep or anything else you like in its place. When you dictate the text, you will say beep at an appropriate time. So as the students are writing, when they hear a beep, they're going to leave a draw a line so they know that there's a word missing. And then afterwards, they're going to fill in each beep with a word that fits into the sentence grammatically. And of course, there is great scope for creativity with this one. So for our French example here, it says, ma soeur beep le chat. So we could put our verb in there and say, ma soeur aime le chat. In our Spanish example, we have, mi hermana beep el pan. So why not have, mi hermana comió el pan. But I'm sure that you can see that there are plenty of other options there. Now, running dictations, um, in the olden days, and I'm talking early 2000s here, um, as part of the Key Stage 3 strategy, we used to call these memory maps, and they were a key thinking skill in those times. They've been rebranded now as running dictations, but essentially they are the same thing. So for this, you're going to need a copy of your complete text and then an outline which the students are going to fill in. So what you can see here is one that I devised for a group of year 10 boys when I did my AST assessment in 2002. So this was for a small group. There was only 14 of them um, and my classroom was pretty small as well. So I only needed one copy of the completed text for them to look at. If you have a bigger group or a bigger room, you might want to have more than one. And I'd also recommend copying them onto A3 to make them easier for the students to read from a slight distance. The next thing to do is to divide the class into pairs or into groups. And the group members are going to take it in turns to come up to the completed text, have a look at it, usually for a time limit of about 10 seconds, then hurry back to their group and dictate to a scribe what they have seen and read to somebody else who's then going to write it. And you can see on this one that there are pictures as well. And of course, that means that it's going to be accessible to all learners. If Even if they can't remember some of the words, they're going to remember one of the pictures. So you decide how many looks each group is going to have and then debrief the activity. And as the students themselves are doing the dictating here, they're going to have to be pretty confident with their phonics. Um, this can also be used, by the way, as an individual activity where each student looks at the text, goes back to their seat and writes on their own copy because they still have to memorise and hold the language in their memory while returning to their seat. So hopefully that's given you lots of ideas for dictation activities that you can do in your classroom. So let's talk now about how you will actually deliver the dictation and get the students writing what they hear. So there are basically three steps. The first step, the teacher reads the whole text through while the students listen and if they have a worksheet stimulus, they look at that while they're listening. They don't write anything at this stage. Secondly, 
the teacher dictates the text section by section. Now you as the teacher decide how big or small those sections are going to be because each class is very different. On your transcript, I would recommend preparing your text, dividing it up with slashes so that you're consistent and you read the same thing each time. And at this stage, the students listen and write what they hear. Finally, you reread the whole text again while the students listen and do a final check of their work. And you can then choose one of the methods that we mentioned earlier to mark it. Now, the home study books that we've already seen from France have some good preparation activities before each of the little dictations. So you might want to consider doing some activities to prepare for the dictation before you actually do it. For sounds or for syllables, students could listen to some sample words and circle the focus sound in those words. Also, they could count how many times they hear a focus sound or a focus syllable in a sample sentence. For words, it might help students to write certain words several times to help to build the memorization and also to build the muscle memory for when they come to write it in the actual dictation. For sentences, you may want to encourage students to repeat the sentence after you before they write it to help them with the understanding and with structure. I mentioned before that I've written a dictation pack for Spanish dictation, starting off at single letter level and finishing at text level, which you might want to have a look at for your students. So I hope that you've enjoyed this presentation all about dictation. Thanks for listening.